Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Oh, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are joined by writer-producer, Mr. Robert hewitt Wolf. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks. So uh, those of you who recognize his name, it's obviously from that one episode of Next Generation that he wrote, <laughs> A Fistful of Datas, <laughs> and probably the uh, 73 other episodes that he was a writer on for Deep Space Nine, maybe that too. 30, 37, but, but yeah, close. I mean, that, 73 writing <laughs> credits, we'll say. <laughs> uh, but before we get into Deep Space Nine, it, is that where you got your start, was uh, pitching to uh, Next Generation? Yeah, that, that was the first thing I sold. I, well, so I went to film school and I was a, a screenwriting major and I won some contests and uh, got an agent while I was still in school. And I had a feature that was hot for a minute. Um, and I, I was, uh, it was supposed to sell. We were literally negotiating with the company and then they went bankrupt for the second time uh, and the deal fell through. Um, but, but I had an agent and my agent at the time represented Joe Minoski. And so she got me an invitation just to pitch to um, Next Generation, even though I'd never written a spec television episode or to any television at all, except for a sitcom we shot at UCLA. And mm -hmm. so they read that spec that I, they read the, the feature that I had almost sold liked it enough that they invited me into pitch. Um, and then I came in and I pitched a couple episodes. They didn't buy either one of them. I pitched a couple more the next meeting. They didn't buy those either. They invited me back a third time. And I was like, hey, man, if I don't sell to them this third time, I'm dead. <laughs> and so, so I pitched in this whole big time travel story, uh, which was basically um, – Picard and Jordy crashing in Watts right before the Watts riots mm -hmm. and Jordy having to protect Picard through all that. And, wow. uh, I was really proud of it. And, uh, and yeah, they were like, well, we're, we're sh thanks. And they were shooting time zero and they were like, well, we don't need a time travel story. I was so frustrated. I banged my head on the arm of the couch that I was sitting on. <laughs> and then I was like, uh, so I got this Western where Worf goes into the holodeck and all the other characters become data. And the only way to end the program is to win a gunfight against an Android with super <laughs> fast reflexes. And they're like, sold. I was like, all right. Uh, so that's how, <laughs> I mean, I did more detail than that, but, but, uh, but yeah, so that was my first sale. And then I, I you know, honestly, I sort of recycled the, the, the Picard, uh, Jordy pitch into, into past tense eventually on, on Deep Space Nine. <laughs> you know, um, before yeah. we move on to Deep Space Nine, just real quick, do you remember anything more about uh, your the the Watts riots uh, script that you had or the pitch? Do you remember B story? Do you remember it? Because it sounds really awesome. I mean, oh, hold on. Let me just mute my phone. Sure. Uh, I guess maybe I should too. Sorry. Uh, I you know the the thing I remember was um, what did I uh, Jordy's visor they were in a shuttle somehow got into a time travel thingy in the shuttle, sort of the same way little green men opens mm -hmm. and they crash in Watts and um, the riots are brewing. Jordy's visor is malfunctioning. So he's blind and they get taken in by a woman who takes pity on them a little bit like um, city on the edge of forever. And they realize the, the riots are happening um and that the woman may be like Jordy's distant great grandmother's you know many times removed so there's a little like potential yeah. grandfather paradox there <laughs> um but they have to accomplish something and i can't remember for the life of me what it was but it's i think they had to go to like to the nuclear reactor at like you at like you know like ucla used to have an experimental nuclear reactor so they had to like get there on foot in 1966 in the middle of the riots or something like that i can't remember all the details <laughs> But it was something like that. Um, wow. Yeah, I was. But it was all about like Picard never and Jordy really never really understanding what. I mean, understanding in the abstract what race what race relations were like in the United States in the sixties, sure. but only in the abstract. Never really experiencing it, like Jordy and Picard both never really experiencing that kind of prejudice. Never mm -hmm. really having to deal with the color of their skin being an issue. So. I thought it was a pretty cool idea. Um, 
and they liked it. <laughs> they just didn't need it, you know, which is, which happens sometimes in TV. So Damn. Yeah. when you pitch an idea like that, do you write out the whole script or do you just write down the points of the different ideas? I write usually to pitch something. I usually write about five or so pages of prose. Um, usually like, and it's usually like single space times new Roman 12. So whatever that, I don't know how many words that is. That might be like a thousand words. I don't know, something like that. Um, but the idea for a pitch to me is like to be able to tell the whole story beginning, middle and end, but really tell it in like 15, 20 minutes tops. Mm -hmm. Um, and mostly these days, I, what I pitch, I don't pitch story ideas. I pitch, you know, series. So that's really like, you know, most of that is spent on the characters and the premise and very little on the actual story because people buy characters when they buy TV shows more than they buy like the, what the pilot episode is. They don't, that doesn't really matter. It's all about the engine of the show. And characters. Um, so, yeah. You know, every time we hear about people that pitched to Star Trek, it makes me wish that there was someone that actually went out and wrote a book on all of the pitches that didn't make it to the screen. I bet, I mean, Sorok and so I were sad. just talking about that last week, but I bet there's some really cool things in there, um, really interesting ones. I mean, I well, mean, as in Deep Space I Nine, you, you saw some of the pitches, right? Well, I took three pitches a week, every week, you know, 50 weeks a year for five wow. years. And each person who came in would pitch some anywhere from like two to sometimes 10 ideas, depending on who it was. Wow. Um, and if you do the math, and that's just me, Ron and Renee and Hans, they were all taking pitches too, right? So that's 12 pitches a week, 600 pitches a year per person. No, yeah, total. 600 pitches a year, say five, that's 3,000 ideas that we as a staff were hearing every year. Wow. And we would buy five or 10. So it was hard because you want everyone to be great. You know, you want people to come in and just shine and blow your doors off. And because a lot of them weren't professional writers and because of the, just the sheer volume, most of them weren't good, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and then were the a lot ones of, that were, go ahead. No, the, were, were they shut down a lot of them because of repeat themes and ideas that were already played out? Yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of like, we've done that before or, or there was also a lot of, we've heard this pitch like from 16 different people and we never liked it. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, right. they used can to, you keep give, a, can you give us one that, that, every, that everybody did? <laughs> now, Next Generation did this thing and I'm, I, I, I'm not endorsing this, but they had a whiteboard that had the most frequently pitched ideas with like hashtags next to it of how many times people pitched it. Oh, and they were funny. stuff like, you know, we got it, they want it, or they got it, we want it, or like, you know, Picard talks his way out of trouble, whatever. But like there, there were both <laughs> themes and then there were larger overarching things like, you know, Living Planet. Like, you know, we, I pitched a Living Planet show. I bet they got pitched that like four or five times a year. I feel like on mm -hmm. D Space Nine, we got pitched that like a few times a year. Um, and it's not like a bad idea. It's just not one that we ever did. I think they just finally kind of weirdly did it on Discovery last year. Um, right, Pavo ish. was the planet. Pavo, whatever the one where the planet, like planetoid, has memory and it's actually a creature or whatever. Yeah, the hell it is, was like the, the spatial called, anomaly. I don't remember what the, I don't remember. The, the title of the episode was called, but the planet was called yeah. Pavo. Yeah. Uh, uh, you have a better memory for these things than me. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, I think there were definitely things that we got over and over again, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of them, you know. They just didn't ring. And then there were the ones where, where like someone comes in and says, uh, so Quark, Rom, and Nog are the little green men in the Roswell crash. And we're like, yeah, done. Yeah, we'll buy that. We're done. You, don't need, you can stop pitching now. You're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's an episode. That's, a, that's an episode. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah, it was just a lot of like trying to find those little gems that people would bring in. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, I was reading I was reading up about you. Sorry, Brian, I just wanted no, to please. get in there. Uh you were really young. Uh, were you the youngest of the writers? Uh, yeah. I was the youngest writer on Deep Space Nine. Yeah. And I think I was younger than everybody on Next Gen too. I might have been. I can yeah. Brandon might be a little younger than me. I don't know. So you were, we, you were in you were in your mid twenties or 
Yeah, uh, let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get too too specific. All right, so I don't want all people right. doing math. All right. But yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, just imagine, I'm just imagining, you know, as a young writer out of college, UCLA, my, my alma mater as well. Um, just to, just what you were going through as far as being on the set, you know, you're there, you're with the big boys. Um, it was intimidating, man. I mean, uh, you know, like working with Michael and Ira, like, and they were pros and Peter Allen Fields, like we started on Man From Uncle. I mean, I was like, whoa, well, you know, trying to hold up, trying to like keep up sometimes. And then being on set too, like, I mean, Avery's a lovely dude, but man, I called him Mr. Brooks for five years. He, he's a, he's a force, you know? Yeah. And uh, I was such a punk and I just felt like this guy's like been on stage. He's been on shows before. He's been a professor. Like who the fuck am I, who the hell am I to, to like suggest that he might want to do something differently than the way he's doing it in a scene. Right. You know, right. uh, um, I mean, we had such a great cast and they were all so talented, man. I mean, it must have felt that way to you, too, Ciroc. I mean, you were in the same situation. I mean, you, I were, was. you, you were you were a kid, man. And you were like surrounded by all these like super pro actors. I mean, oh, my God, that cast was like from top to it was a murderous row that cast. Right. So, I mean, it, it was it was. And if you didn't if you didn't if you were ready, it, it would be pretty obvious. <laughs> they start rolling yeah. camera. <laughs> you had to come. You had to come correct on Star Trek, man. You yeah. couldn't. You couldn't improvise your way through a scene either. Like you had to yeah. know it word perfect. I mean, I, I, uh, I was incredibly impressed by you and by Aaron. You mm. know, for being able to like come and keep up and be, be, you know, that level of preparedness that you had to be for that show. You know, I bet. I bet if you didn't come correct. Uh, you know, well, Avery probably was going to check me. Yeah, Avery that's was, what I was going to say. <laughs> he, he was in charge of checking me, so he made sure I was ready. As a matter of fact, that was the first thing he would say when we got into the, you know, when he, I saw him in the makeup trailer, and that would be, "Are you ready to go?" And if I wasn't, then he'd make sure that I was. So, yeah, I bet. I think the only guy, to correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe we're talking a little out of school here, but the only guy I know for sure on the cast who could just sit there and read his lines right before a scene and know them by heart was Sid, right? Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I think Colin was pretty damn good, too. Yeah, I, yeah. Pretty, Colin really pretty much nailed it. He knew what He knew what was expected out of him. So he, Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is, like, I felt like I, I caught Sid a couple of times. He wasn't prepared. And he was able to like just <laughs> wing it, read the lines, and like put them uh, into his head right away, and just like he had some kind of like mnemonic like ability that I was yeah. like, I was like, you're not prepared, but you you are when the cameras roll. So God bless. You got to be careful <laughs> with that techno babble, yeah. though. He had some uh, some oh. medical techno babble every once in a while. You got to learn uh, those lines. I mean, we didn't even write some of those lines. We just wrote the word tech in the script and wait when our tech <laughs> advisors would tell us what the words were supposed to be. Someone would show up. What was speaking, the one? Yeah. Speaking of that, you had so many rewrites. I don't know. Were you guys just rewriting everything all the time? I just remember like being on the set and you're like, no, 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 no. It's not what it's not that anymore. It's this. Well, yeah. I mean, remember there were like five writers for the whole show and there were 26 episodes a year. And so we were always like, like running as fast as we could. And so we'll, we would get notes continually from like Rick or from, you know, like we would do things ourselves where we give our each other's notes. But a lot of times like Rick was giving us all these notes, wanting us to revise scenes and like sometimes like well into production, we were going to like double cherries for those of you who don't know, like every time you put out a new draft in a television show, you, it's a new color. And there's like, on Deep Space Nine, we used all the colors. We used like buff and tan and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we would go through them sometimes like two or three times, right? I mean, that's yes. like 30 revisions. And every time we changed the stuff, the poor actors had to learn the stuff again. It was, it was a crazy way to do. It was crazy. It was crazy. I got to tell you, Ciroc, on, on elementary, I shot like first blues on an episode and that was it. Like That was it? No. Yeah, blues? first blues, first blues. Like that's one revision because we locked the scripts down. But but my goal is always to shoot first whites, and I've never managed to do it. I've never managed to have a script that goes all the way through production and is just like first white. 
One day. Never changed a word. No, One day, maybe. Know. Maybe. Probably will never happen. <laughs> uh, real quick, though, I did want to say uh, Prodigal Son, right? Um, yeah. You're working, because you mentioned elementary, and there you've got mm -hmm. a lot of really cool credits on your IMDb other than uh, Deep Space Nine and, and Next Generation. Uh, a couple things I didn't know about. Uh, I didn't know that you produced Prodigal Son. Um, yeah, well, on, on Prodigal Son, I, I actually really only worked on that show for like a few months. Um, so I was a consulting producer and they brought me in mostly to help. Uh, so when a show gets commissioned by a network, they usually commission 13 episodes. And then in success, they usually ask for nine more. That's called the back nine. And on, on Prodigal Son, they, they, wanted the, they ordered the back nine and, they, and the writers felt like they could use a little extra help. Uh, to get those back nine done. So they hired me and one other writer to, to come in and help out. And, uh, and then because of COVID-19, that back nine got shortened to a back seven. So I really only worked on the show for seven episodes. In fact, I was on, I was on set in New York shooting my episode when we pulled the plug because of COVID-19 and shut down all production. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a consulting producer, but like, honestly, I, I had very little I mean, I contributed for sure. Like, you know, I, I, I helped supervise an episode. I wrote an episode, even though it never got shot. Um, but I wasn't like integral to the process on that show from the very beginning. You know, I was really just a hired gun who came in for a little bit. Okay. Uh, also, secondarily, uh, Andromeda. Uh, yeah. I remember when that was the big buzz, like all the rage <laughs> back in like 2004 or five, somewhere right yeah. around there. Uh, because 2000. 2000. Because Wow, was it that long ago? Yeah. Because um, yeah. I was like two. Uh, because uh, it was Gene Roddenberry's other baby, right? I mean, he, I don't know. I don't Florida. know. <laughs> exactly. That, that's what we heard. That's what we heard as fans. And I kind of wanted to know, like, how much of Gene Roddenberry was in Andromeda and how much of it was it, you know, the other writers and producers just kind of taking it and running with it? I mean, to be perfectly honest, it was like, Two percent Gene and ninety-eight percent me. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what what happened was uh, Tribune had the rights to develop any of Gene's unproduced material, and he had written, you know, there were stacks of stuff, scripts. A lot of them. A lot of it was a. Uh, a lot of it was based on some of his work for uh, a show called New Genesis, which was about like civilization falls on Earth, and this guy from Earth has been asleep for three hundred years. And he wakes up and he tries to like help rebuild civilization. So that's the premise of the show. That was Gene. The idea of a sentient starship I took from a different proposal he'd done for a show called Starship, which was completely different from Andromeda, but did have the kernel of a starship that was a, a living being, essentially, a sentient AI. So that was him. Uh, the villains in New Genesis were genetically engineered. They were called the Tyrians. And so I use them as the basis for the villains in Andromeda, who were the Nietzscheans. And the main, the main uh, Nietzschean was named Tyr after that. Okay. And that's it. That's pretty much, that was, that was, and the name Dylan Hunt for the character who's gets suspended in time. So I sort of combined the elements from Starship and New Genesis, and then everything else is basically me. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's why it says developed by Robert Hewitt Wolf, because I... <laughs> You did a lot of developing. I did a lot of developing on that show. It's all good. I mean, look, the, the truth is, like, no one was, you know, super excited to see Robert Wolf's Andromeda. They were super excited to see Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. And 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 the show wouldn't have existed without his material. It was based on his material. Sure. Um, but it was not a situation where he'd, like, written an entire script and left it behind. It was, which he had done for Earth Final Conflict. So Earth Final Conflict, I believe he had written an entire pilot that, that was the basis for that show. That wasn't the case for Andromeda. Really? No. Well, that's really cool. That I just remember that back in the day, people were like, hey, it's like this new show that's like based off of Roddenberry, you know, but we never knew yeah. exactly how much of it, what, if it was just based on an idea or how far it was developed. Uh, it's really cool to know. Um, yeah. Un unfortunately, like the show itself, they gave this, I mean, I came from Deep Space Nine where we could like do anything and we had like, you know, this incredible crew who'd done Star Trek for 10 years and, and, uh, and we didn't have any of that infrastructure and we didn't have any of the money. And so mm. like, 
I came up with all these ideas that in retrospect, I would, I would never have tried to do because we just, the show does not look great if you've looked at it recently. Mm. Um, and that's because we just had no money. We had half the budget of Deep Space Nine. And a lot of that was taken up by our lead. So and about one twentieth of the budget of Discovery. Well, yeah, I mean, adjusted for inflation, <laughs> okay. it's probably about a third the budget of Discovery. I would say, if you adjust it all for inflation, or a quarter. Uh, oh my God, they spend so much money on that show. God bless. It looks great, but uh, yeah, we didn't have we didn't have that money on Deep Space Nine. There were things, uh, you know, every once in a while I look at a, a Deep Space Nine, and I'm like, man, I wish we had a little more money to make that look a little bit better, but. Mm. Hey, it was great for the time. At the time, it was cutting edge stuff. So, you know, sometimes actors get pigeonholed into different uh, categories. Is it the same for writers and, and the topics that they do? Are you like the science fiction writer, or are you just the writer? I, I think of myself as a writer, but just like actors think of themselves as actors, you write. Writers get pigeonholed just like actors do. Um, and for a long time, I really only got work on science fiction shows. Uh, and then I was lucky enough to get um, elementary. And now I get, mm -hmm. you know, now I can get work on science fiction shows or murder mysteries. <laughs> so <laughs> now right. I've, got I've got two pigeonholes <laughs> that I can live in. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I've done horror too. And I've done like, uh, you know, fantasy. Um, but yeah, for most of my career, I've been like the genre guy, which is, which is weird because like the, one of my big script sales was a historical. Like it was actually like about the conquest of Mexico. And another one was like an action adventure. I'd sold an action adventure show or two, a movie or two. None of them gotten made. Um, and the first script that I ever wrote that got me my agent was a, was a, was a romantic comedy. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it had some fantasy elements, but it definitely was romantic comedy first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's been weird. I, I, I've become a science fiction guy because of Star Trek. That's all right. It's been fun. I'm doing good. <laughs> so you never set out to be a, a sci-fi writer then. You just kind of, it wasn't just kind of like your genre as you you were wanting to, aspiring to be a writer. It just kind of fell into it, you think? Well, it was certainly a genre I enjoyed. And mm -hmm. and, and and certainly like that big feature that I, I almost sold that fell through that got me the TNG in, you know, job was a big science fiction epic type thing. And I've written a few of those. Um, but I just, I just love to write. So I've written all kinds of stuff. Um, but I, I love genre. I mean, I love science fiction and fantasy. Uh, I, I, I was starting to spec a sci-fi pilot right now. And then I got all this other stuff I had to do. So I haven't gotten back to it, but you know, I would, I would happily do it. You know, there's a, a project I'm up to adapt right now. That's a big space epic -y type thing. And we'll see if I get anywhere with it. Um, it's a fun genre to do, but I'm also pitching like, you know, uh, a network procedural this year. Too. <laughs> so really, yeah, you know, murder mysteries are, <laughs> are, uh, are, if done right, or it can be a lot of fun. Mm, definitely. So, um, as you know, we lost our, our good brother, uh, Mr. Aaron Eisenberg, yeah. uh, eight months ago and uh, we bring people on, we talk about him every once in a while. And you, you may have some insights on him that we, we've never heard before in that um, I kind of want to know what your first impressions were when you, when you first saw him in that, in that first episode or in that first season. And if that impacted how you wrote for him in future seasons uh, or any, anything like that. Well, the first thing to know is like one of the things that writers are always looking for when we look at dailies and we look at cuts are like who's bringing the words to life, you know, mm -hmm. and really like bringing that extra spark and not just delivering what we what we want on the page, because that's the minimum, like, please at least give us that, you know, but really, can you can you bring us something extra? And one of the things that struck me about Aaron, I mean, about Ciroc too, to be honest, but but about Aaron was that he definitely did that. Like he, he just brought so much energy and so much personality that everything we wrote for him and he del not just delivered the scenes, but like nailed them, you know? And so what that does for writers is it just inspires you with confidence that you can write anything you want for a guy that like that and, and they're going to deliver. And so that's why Aaron got more and more scenes, you know? Mm -hmm. 
the people that we wrote, the people that started out who could have been nothing characters and just come and gone, but that stuck around for seven years and kept getting scene after scene after scene after scene. The reason is because they inspired the writers with confidence. And so that like first thing when you see Aaron, you're like on, on dailies, you're like, oh, well, this kid delivers, right? He delivers. So we're going to write for him. And then the other, the other thing though, is like, uh, I think it was like, I'd been on the show for a couple of weeks. He'd done a scene of, in my episode, in an episode I wrote, and it was really good. He did a really nice job. And I, he was on stage and I went down to say, thank you. And you're great. And all that stuff. And I was like, man, you know, for, for a young, you know, young actors like you don't usually have so much, you know, it's tough for them to bring so much to the screen, you know? And he's like, dude, I'm 21 <laughs> or whatever. It was, how old was he? He was like 20. Is that how old he, he was? I, I, something like, yeah, something like that. 21, 22. Yeah. So I had no idea how old he was. He was in makeup when I was talking to him. Right. So I couldn't <laughs> see his face, obviously because of his health issues, he was small. And yeah. so I, I had no idea. I, I thought he was 12 years old. I honestly thought the kid was 12 years old and I was so embarrassed and I was so like, I'm so sorry, man. He, he was totally cool about it. I was like, I've never seen you out of makeup. I have no idea what you look like. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he was, he was, he was, he was a grown man, man. He, you know, and he was, yeah. he was ready for the gig and he, mm -hmm. yeah, he was playing a younger character than he was, but he was terrific. And you guys were so good together. Like you guys were always, that was just money. Like if we could yeah, write a yeah. scene for Jake and Nog, pff, that, that scene was going to be so charming and so much fun. And like, we figured that out pretty damn quick. I think, uh, that whole thing with the stem stem bolts, that whole B story where you guys are like <laughs> selling this yeah. to get that and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, it's just so much fun and you're just, and it's great. And it's, and it was really important to have that on the show. Cause it was like, it, it could get to be a pretty dark and serious show sometimes. Is that a self stealing mm. stem bolt behind it you? It sure is right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm impressed that I remember what the hell that looked like. Yeah. Uh, Nah, so yeah, Aaron, Aaron was Aaron was a gift to gift to us. And a, a lot, I mean, you know, he wasn't unique in that, and that we just had an incredibly talented cast. We were very lucky. Um, or Michael was very good at casting, <laughs> or both. Um, but boy, he was he was and so much energy and enthusiasm, and you'd never know he was struggling with health issues for for most of his life, man. Um, and you know, just a great kid, great guy. <laughs> Great guy. It sucks. It's very sad. Can you think? Can you think of anything, uh, Robert? Um, like whether it was a scene or an idea or a pitch for for Jake or for Nog or for Jake and Nog that never made it to the screen that might be a, a fun or interesting thing for us to to chew on. Like, was there ever going to be a moment where? Jake was going to go and save the Cardassian Empire. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember anything off the top of my head, but I can tell you uh, why the big turn happened for both of those characters, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which is the um, why Jake doesn't go to Starfleet and why Nog does, which is um, I'm an army brat. Um, my dad was a Green Beret. And uh, when I was like, 13 or 14 years old, I got letters from the military academy saying like, you know, keep us updated on your grades, contact your senator, you know, you, you should be coming to the military academies basically. And, uh, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> um, um, my dad was messed up, man. He did two tours of duty in Vietnam. He, he had demons and I didn't want to live that life. And I just, so that is the reason that Jake doesn't go to Starfleet like, and wants to be a writer because it's a little bit of me stealing my own story. And wow. yeah. And Ron had a similar story. Like Ron was like a, I think ROTC and stuff. And he also eventually bailed on the idea of being in the military. So there was some from both of us of having like had the dads who went through it. And we just thought that could be an interesting story to tell for Jake, because I think a lot of the audience expected Jake to become right. Starfleet and the thing that the conversation that we had as writers was like if that's what the audience expects that's not what should happen 
if anyone should become a Starfleet officer, it should be Nog, man, because they'll never yeah. see that coming. <laughs> and that was so that was why we did that, why we subverted expectation. And and I think it worked really well. I hope I hope you guys enjoyed doing it and playing it. Um, but we just thought it was it was interesting to see the the the, the Starfleet brat who just who wants to do something else and why. Well, God, when this kid was 10 years old, his mom died, right. like in the same room as him during a Starfleet battle. I mean, this guy's seen nothing but war and craziness for his whole youth. Why would he want more of that? You know? I mean, so we always thought that that was an interesting way to go for Jake. Um, and it led to some beautiful episodes. Uh, and it led to some great episodes for Nog, too. Uh, mm-hmm. The other way around, this kid who, who, it's the immigrant experience for Nog, right? It's the the kid who's an immigrant, maybe an illegal immigrant and joins the army, <laughs> which is a story that I've seen a million, you know, you see sometimes these kids that, you know, want to get citizenship, want to be part of the country that they're living in. And so that was the story. Well, yeah. Anyway, that I don't have an untold story, but I have a, a backstory to a told story. Well, I, I had no idea about the Jake uh, having that personal tie to you. And that's pretty interesting to know. I mean, it just informs me that much more. But also the, the the story about uh, you know Nog, I mean I think it meant a lot to him. And you mentioned the fact that you know uh, your dad was messed up off of two tours, and he was you know, and there was there were some of those things elements that you added into the script with uh, the PTSD and these kinds of things. Yeah, I, I wasn't there for some of the the end stuff, like some of that end run, because I was only there for the first five seasons. But I, I think, you know, we, we always intended, to, it was never going to be a parade of roses for Nog to go down that path. Was gonna, we always thought it should be challenging and, and difficult for him. Um, but we always also thought he was destined for greatness in Starfleet. And so we just thought that that was a really, you know, a, an interesting path of that character. And I, I love that, like, Star Trek Online, like, Captain Nog is still there. Yeah. You know, giving missions to people. I think that there's something really sweet about that. Um, I, do, I do too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I can you read Absalom in that game? Can you find Jake's novel somewhere? Because that'd be fun too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know either. Uh, but but I I, I I like that that he has that 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 immortality, or at least as long as that game goes. Um, you know, mm-hmm. the life of an M O M M O R P G is not infinite, but at least as long as it goes, he'll be there. That's pretty cool. You know, all of these uh, these videos that we do, uh, these interview type uh, videos, they're called CNFs, which is Captain Nog Forever. So oh, nice. uh, we definitely, and and the people love it. Um, it's it's kind of like our battle cry on this show, you know, Captain Nog Forever. Um, yeah. That's uh, it's really cool, and and we'll have to ask Al at, over at a. Uh, Star Trek Online about Ciroc's book. We'll see, we'll see if they've got <laughs> some kind of library in Star Trek Online or something where you can find it. It'd be nice. It'd be nice to find it in a library or if it's on a, you know, online, if, you, if you're going through the, like, whatever you go through to choose your book that you want to read. I, I, I know that in, um, in World of Warcraft, there's a lot of books around. And if you click on them, you can actually pull them out and read them. And they're usually just like oh, two, wow. three page story. They're, they're, but they have stuff in them a lot of the time. I don't know whether... You can find Absalom, but it'd be be interesting if you could. Absalom. It's super dense literary fiction, though. It's hard to read. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do people always convince, uh, like, confuse you with uh, George Clooney? Do, do people say? <laughs> I wish. I wish. I would. I would. I would have a very good good uh, feature career if I, if I were George Clooney. <laughs> He's written more movies than me, man. He's gotten more Emmy nominations too. Yeah, as a writer. Well, I don't know. I see a little. <laughs> I see well, a little yeah, Richard I mean, Gear in there. I I'll take Richard man, I'll take it all. I'll take it all. You, you, you want to say I look? I look like a handsome actor. I'll take it, man. Yeah, you never know. You might have a second career. I, yeah, I could play like the old lawyer, like the guy who comes in and is like, "My client has nothing to say to you." I could do that. <laughs> it's about the range of my acting skill. That's about it, right? Nope. There. You nailed nothing. it. You nailed it. Though. Say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you paying me if you're going to talk to these people? <laughs> How so fun what, was it to get together for the writing, the writers' room? I'm sorry. Oh man, it was place. such a blast! It was so much fun. 
Um, Cause for us I watching mean, it, yeah, it was just like first time seeing that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd been in a room with all those guys in a long time, maybe since the rap party. I mean, I see them each individually, but to have everybody together and to like actually break story, it's pretty cool. I mean, you guys get to do some of that. And I guess the conventions, you get to see each other more often than we see each other. Um, yeah. But yeah. for us, it was it was pretty special. I mean, you know, I'll have lunch with Ira every once in a while, but but to have all five of us to be sitting there to be talking the show, to be thinking about a mythical season eight, it was it was pretty special. Um, yeah, that was a good time. That was five years ago already. I can't believe that. Wow, it took so long for that damn documentary to come out. <laughs> yeah. You know, though that that uh, from a fan's perspective, that at least myself, that was the highlight of the documentary was watching you guys work, watching kind of like the, the writer's dream team come back together and just kind of bounce these ideas around. It really, you know, it was really like a creative moment, you know, and it, it was definitely the highlight of the, the documentary for me personally. I thought so too. Thanks, man. Thanks. I mean, it was, it was so much fun to do. And I know they have like eight hours of material and they keep threatening to like release it all. It's like a feat. Do it, it's like do a it. thing. <laughs> I know. I know. For the audience, I don't know how many people would actually sit and watch the whole thing. It definitely plays better when you can cut away and you can just like show these cool animations. There's no way they're doing all that animation for the whole thing. Um, <laughs> it was fun to do, man. That was real, that was a fun day. Really well, fun we day. I, from the viewer standpoint, I like seeing how the thought process works and just. Mm-hmm. How you guys bounce ideas off each other, how you shoot down ideas, uh, you know, and the board, putting things up on the board. I think that was really great. I mean, it, it was a pretty accurate, I mean, that is how we did it. I mean, that uh, we, we, we probably, you saw at the end, like where we run out of time, we just like threw down a whole bunch of stuff. But, <laughs> right, right. But aside from, <laughs> or maybe that part isn't in there. I can't remember. But there's a whole there's a whole thing in the end where we're like, we got 20 minutes left. Like how, and we got three acts to go. Let's just <laughs> wrap like, it up. Throw down we think is gonna go. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, we we broke story pretty quickly as a group because we didn't have time. We didn't have time to do it slowly. So that was a pretty a lot of shows like that process that you see over that eight hours can take two weeks you know, of like five, six hours a day at least. Um, but on Deep Space Nine, we did it fast because we didn't have the time not to do it fast. We had 26 episodes. Yeah. <laughs> Back then, you guys were doing 26 episodes a year. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not just us too, but the crew and the actors, everybody, like that's just, it's a, that's a big, big burden. It's a lot. Um, mm. And, and, you know, as I've, if we get behind, the crew can't stop working, so we just had to go faster. Yeah. That was it. You know, they could only shoot. You guys were doing like fourteen-hour days too, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's crazy too. Like, oh, I actually, days. He worked with Michael Pillar in the beginning, right? Um, yeah. yeah. What was he like? What was he like working with? Because I, I didn't get a chance to really be around him as much. Um, but he was a nice guy to me when he came down to the set, but. Michael was a, Michael was a really sweet guy, a really kind and generous guy and um, and a, a great person. He was not always easy to work for because for the writers because he was also fairly internal and sometimes it was hard for him to like explain what he wanted. It was more like just take a shot at it and then I'll do whatever, you know, give me the pages and I'll figure it out. So th- that meant that sometimes you it was a little bit like blind man's bluff, right? A lot of times you were trying to figure out what would Michael do in this scene and you, you didn't really always have the clearest marching orders because he was also like scrambling and sometimes it was just easier for him to get pages and just rewrite them and make them work for the way he wanted them to work. Um, and he was very, very talented, um, but he was also very, very particular. You know, he wanted things to be just so. And... Uh, and so it was, it was, um, it could have, it was sometimes difficult to anticipate what he needed. I mean, because the job when you're on staff is really to help the showrunner, right? The whole job of being a staff writer is to make that guy's job easier, that woman's job easier, to give them the material they need so they can rewrite as little as possible and take that burden away from them. And Michael didn't always make it easy to do that part of the job. And in fact, there was a moment where he was going to fire me at the end of the first season. 
uh, and I, which I mean, I got it, you know, I was a snot nosed kid and I was doing my best. Uh, and Ira convinced him to let me stay. Uh, and, uh, and Michael later said he was glad that that's how it worked out. And I, I love, I love the guy who was a great guy. Um, mm. and there was never any malevolence to it. It was just his process was sometimes a little bit difficult. You know? Yeah. Uh, but I was also young. I didn't know what the hell I was doing half the time. Like I, I was like, <laughs> I mean, I was not, I mean, I was, I would have probably been fumbling in the dark, even if I did have good marching orders half the time, because I was so young and just figuring things out, you know, uh, anyway. You know, um, we only have a couple minutes left, uh, but real quick, I just remembered, you know, uh, in a few days later on, we're going to be reviewing Second Skin, which I believe you wrote, yeah. um, at least teleplay by, I believe. Not, I think it's all me. So yeah, I think it's all you, me. You have any uh, final thoughts on that before we we're going to review it with Nana, uh, and I mean, I pa I'll think, pass along the message that you gave me. By the way, <laughs> well, I'll say it to the audience. I mean, I think <laughs> Nana gives a spectacular performance in that, and I I feel terrible because I didn't know when we wrote the episode that she has some claustrophobia issues. So having all that Cardassian makeup on her was really really tough, and uh, and so I I, I I I once again apologize to Nana for putting her through that. Um, but we just had like we had terrific um, pressmen, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, guy who played the Cardassian. Um, he was from Barney Miller. Uh, we had some great guest cast on that. We were again like, as a lot of times on the show, we were just blessed with these terrific uh, guest actors, um, and uh, and that story was a recycle of the very first thing I pitched to Star Trek. I pitched really? a, a version of that story to Next Generation long, long ago, but it, was, it wasn't the same, but it was basically a version of that story. That was the very first thing I ever pitched to Next Generation, and they didn't buy it, and I kept it sort of in my head and eventually figured out a way to make it work for Deep Space Nine, um, and so that was, that was the, the sort of use all parts of the buffalo Finally, that story came around, and I got it on as, as a Deep Space Nine. Same way I finally did with the with the Watts story, kind of with the past tense and the riots and all that stuff. Um, yeah. We'll be covering so, yeah. that one next month. Yeah, looking forward. Yeah, to that. that's the <laughs> that one is like the one that people on the internet are always like prophetic, and I'm like, it wasn't supposed to be prophetic. <laughs> we'll find it out a year. cautionary tale. <laughs> Stop coming true. <laughs> I want our stuff to come good. you know when we write these 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 scary like predictions of the future how things could go if things go wrong you're not supposed to use them as a playbook <laughs> <laughs> uh now yeah. lastly uh you did say you're writing a book or you finished writing a book right uh well i've nice written a trilogy that. actually i've written three wow. books um the third one is coming out in july and they're uh they're for middle readers they're for 10 to 14 year old and they're um fantasy uh, awesome. and they're about, uh, three modern high school kids and it's like Lion the witch in the wardrobe. They get transported to a magical land, uh, and they get saved by the bad guys. They get rescued by the goblins who've just lost this war against the humans. And the goblins have a prophecy that whenever they're in trouble, a human child will appear in the caves beneath their city and become their king and save them. So they're like, one of these three kids must be the king. <laughs> wow, and so great. it's, it's that kind of thing. And it, and it is a, by the end, and I, I just, like I said, I just turned in the third book. It is a giant epic fantasy. It just has this sort of in as a, as a, as a middle reader's thing. But like, there's a 70 page battle at the end of the, not even at the end, almost at the end of the third book, there's this, this giant battle uh, that I, that I took me weeks to write. Um, and I'm very proud of them. They turned out really well. The first one's called um, The Goblin Crown. The second one is called, uh, the fallen star and the finale is called uh the final drop and the other thing that i'm i, I like i'm I, I hope people will enjoy about these books is that um these kids are diverse they're not like the pevensey kids from lion the witch in the wardrobe the main character is mixed race and uh the girl he sort of falls for on the first day of high school is filipina and the, the bully is is a white dude <laughs> and so those are the three kids and and so it's a it's a diverse you know it's a diverse group and uh and i think star trek fans will see a lot of the same themes and will like you know see some of that world building that we did with the klingons and the ferengi uh reflected in the goblin culture 
there's a whole like um, th- a glossary in the back of the book with goblin words and what they mean in English. Wow. So definitely will be familiar to people who learned Klingon or learned a little, yeah. uh, you know, learned what some Cardassian words were or, or, or gem, you know, not that we did a lot of gem and our words, but you know what I mean? It was a lot of sort of culture creation. I'm getting like sun right, right there. <laughs> yeah, we get some sometimes right here. Sometimes, yeah. Are you uh, influenced by Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien? I mean, it was the first fantasy book I ever read, I Me think. Uh, although, no, I read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and Prince Caspian first, and then I read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings after that. So, yeah, those are big influences on me. I mean, if you guys have ever uh, seen The Legend of the Ferengi that Ira and I wrote, there's a whole – under the – so Ira and I wrote this book called Legend of the Ferengi, which is each rule of acquisition with a little parable attached to it. Really? Um, yeah. And it was published by Pocket Books. We did it while we were on the show, so 20 years ago. And yeah. uh, I'm going to try to get out of the sun. I know that sun's really coming at you. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, and so uh, in the about the author's section, if you read it, it's all an homage to The Lord of the Rings. The whole thing is yeah. like a wink to the Lord of the Rings, where we basically say that Ira and I were two hobbits who met, you know, because we had to get rid of this ring and we had these big adventures and we finally just <laughs> chucked the thing into a fiery pit outside of Las Vegas and came to Los Angeles to be TV writers. <laughs> oh, interesting. Acknowledge, interesting. Acknowledging, acknowledging <laughs> our original. Oh, keep moving. Keep moving. See more of the poster. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> Legends of the Ferengi and the Rules of yeah. Acquisition. Okay. Re- Legends of the Ferengi is out of print, I think, but I saw like you, it, it has like, you know, we, I think they sold like 50,000 copies or something. So there's copies out there. People want to nice. try to get them. <laughs> we'll find them. They'll find them. <laughs> and yeah. uh, we'll also include uh, some links where people can get your books in the, cool. the uh, description box below. Cool. Sounds really cool. And I'm and I'm sure you don't have to be 12 years old to read it, right? I can be 27 and read it, right? I, I feel like you're you're young enough. You're still young enough. Sorak is still <laughs> young enough to read them and enjoy them. Uh, I think uh, so. But also your kids are hopefully would enjoy them. Too. Yeah, I'm thinking about my daughter. She's about to be 10. So perfect. Uh yeah, it's um it's definitely like I would say 10 and up because the opening scene is uh the main goblin at the end of the big battle between the goblins and the humans. And he's been hiding under a corpse for most of the battle because he doesn't want to get killed. And he's like sneaking away. So it's definitely like, you know, <laughs> it's it's got some strong themes if you're younger than 10, but I feel like 10, 10 and up is a good age. Yeah. Brian, yeah. Cool. you can read it. You have permission. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've been warming up to it. I feel like I'm ready for the 10, 10 year old level now. I'm almost uh, there. I love, yeah, I love, reading YAs man they're so much fun yeah. a lot of them yeah. you know and a lot of them are be- uh, there's a, some really beautifully written ones and the only reason they're mm-hmm. called YAs is because their main characters are 15 years old you know um yeah. it's a fun genre great well uh we're just about out of time here uh Robert but we do want to thank you very much for joining us this was extremely entertaining and enlightening um it's great to yeah. great to do it, and it's great to see you, Sir Rock. Uh, it's great to see you. Yeah, it's uh, it's always old home week. You know, it always feels to me like you know, I get very nostalgic whenever I get a chance to see somebody and hang out and talk a little bit. And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we're all still insufferably proud of the show too. So <laughs> there's that. You, can, you, you can't escape it. You know, no matter what, it's just it's just there. You know, I talk with Avery every once in a while. And, you know, we talk about the show because it's just it's just part of who we are and, and it's inescapable at this point. You know? Yeah, just have I haven't seen Avery since the rap party. So if next time you talk to him, please give him my best, man, and and tell I him he, he, he freaking killed that role. He was so great and it was <laughs> such an honor. It was an honor and a, ple- a pleasure to write for him. It was It was an honor to write for all you guys. You guys just, that cast, like I've been in television since, like, I I mean, except for elementary, I don't think I've ever had a cast from top to bottom. Uh, I should say Prodigal Son has a great cast. But I don't think I've ever had a cast <laughs> from top to bottom that was as strong as that. And I didn't know how good I had it at the time. It was just like, oh, my God, like, they're all so good. You're all mm-hmm. so good. I mean, yeah. God bless well, you. Yeah. Uh, rest in peace to the late, great Rene Aubergine. Just everybody yeah. was just really brought brought their A game. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah, same. 
Renee, it's it's so it's it's so sad that we've lost two already, and and um, you know, uh, I, it 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 brings home how passing all of this is, and like how lucky we were all to be able to work together for all those mm. years. Um, it, it makes you think about your mortality, but I, I'm glad we have, we'll always have those 154? No. Yeah. More. 170, 76. 176, 176 oh. episodes. We'll always have those. <laughs> we'll always have those, yeah. We'll always have the hollow sweet. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I thought it was 170. I'm checking on that right now. No, it's, it's 176, <laughs> I believe. That's I guess I should probably take your word for it. I feel like Sorak <laughs> is right. I think 154 was actually elementary. No, we were, yeah, 150. Yeah, that was elementary. <laughs> elementary was 154. I've been on two shows that made 150 plus, so. That, that was, yeah, that's wow. not easy to do. No, it's man, Andromeda was 110, although I only worked on the first two seasons of that, mm. so. Um, yeah. Just keep plugging away, man. <laughs> we're going to keep looking out for, for your next projects and what you do next. I mean, when Hollywood opens back up again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, might be whenever that happens, and we can make whenever, television again. Whenever that happens, you know. But uh, until then, we're going to be looking out for this book, and you know, looking out for the other drums as you've already left us, like the legends of the Ferengi. <laughs> so, all right, you've, you've dropped a lot of gems on us. So, <laughs> thanks for for sharing your time with us. Well, thanks for having me, and uh, you know, live long and prosper, and all that stuff, and. Uh, yeah. And if you, uh, I'd happy, happily do this again if you ever want to have me back on to talk about a specific episode or something. Awesome. Uh, we would absolutely love that. That was awesome. All right, guys. Uh, I'm. Uh, should I just end it, or are you gonna like end record? How do we? How do we? We're do gonna. This? I, I do a thing. Check this out. Watch this. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you all very much for joining us, and always remember the seventh rule. See, it's pretty cool, right? I don't know. There That's it good. Is. I like it. I like it. <laughs>